Hello, welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara, and we're going to, we're going to, today, we're going to finish reading chapter, I believe, 19 of Dickens' Dombey and Son, and then we're going to get on to summarizing chapters 13 through 19 in, in a brief summary, and so let's get there. Was he, said Florence, thank you, Walter, oh, thank you, Walter, I was afraid you might be going away and hardly thinking of me, and again she gave him her little hand so freely and so faithfully that Walter held it for some moments in his own and could not bear to let it go. Yet Walter did not hold it as he might have held Held it. Once or once, nor did its touch awaken those old daydreams of his boyfriend, boyhood, excuse me. <laughs> different era, different times. Not quite like ours that had floated past him sometimes even lately and confused him with their indistinct and broken shapes, the purity and innocence of her endearing manner and its perfect trustfulness and the undisguised regard for him that lay so deeply seated in her constant eye and glowed upon her fair face through the smile that shaded. For alas, it was a smile too, as sad to brighten. It were not Excuse me. It were not of their romantic race. They brought back to his thoughts that early deathbeds, the, to his thoughts, the early deathbed he had seen her tending and the love the child had borne her. And on the wings of such remembrance she seemed to rise up far above his idle fancies into clearer and serener air. I, I am afraid I must call you Walter's uncle, sir said Florence to the old man, if you'll let me. My dear young lady, cried old Saul, let you, good gracious. We always knew you by that name and talked of you, said Florence, glance, glancing around and sighing gently. The nice old parlor, the just the same. How well I recollect it. Old Saul looked first at her, then at his nephew, and then rubbed his hands and rubbed his spectacles and said below his breath, ah, time, time, time. There was a short silence during which Susan Nipper skillfully impounded two extra cups and saucers from the cupboard and awaited the drawing of the tea with a thoughtful air. I want to tell Walter's uncle, said Florence, laying her hand timidly upon the old man's as it rested on the table to bespeak his attention. Something that I am anxious about. He is going to be left alone. And if he will allow me not to take Walter's place, for that I couldn't do, but to be his true friend and help him if I ever can while Walter is away, I shall be very much obliged to him indeed. Will you, may I, Walter's uncle? The instrument maker, without speaking, put her hand to his lips, and Susan Nipper, leaning back with her arms crossed in the chair of presidency, under which she had voted herself, bit one end of her bonnet strings, and heaved a gentle sigh as she looked up at the skylight. You will let me come to see you, said Florence, when I can, and you will tell me everything about yourself and Walter, and you will have no secrets from Susan when she comes and I do not, but will confide in us and trust us and rely upon us, and you'll try to let us be a comfort to you, will you, Walter's uncle? The sweet face looking into his, the gently pleading eyes, the soft voice, and the light touch on his arm made the more winning by a child's respect and honor for his age, that gave to all an air of graceful doubt and modest hesitation. These and her natural earnestness so overcame the poor old instrument maker that he only answered, Wally, say a word for me, my dear. I am very grateful. No, Walter returned Florence with her quiet smile. Say nothing for him, if you please. I understand him very well. We must learn to talk together without you, dear Walter. The regretful tone in which she said these little latter words touched Walter more than all the rest. Miss Florence replied with an effort to recover the cheerful manner he had preserved while talking with his uncle. I know no more than my uncle what to say in acknowledgment of such kindness, I am sure. But what could I say after all? If I had the power of talking for an hour, except that it is like you. Susan Nipper began upon a new part of her bonnet string and nodded at the skylight in approval of the, sentient, of the sentiment expressed. Oh, but Walter, said Florence, there's something that I wish to say to you before you go away, and you must call me Florence. 
if you please, and not speak like a stranger. Like a stranger, returned Walter. No, I couldn't speak so. I am sure, at least, I couldn't feel like one. I, but that is not enough. And is not what I mean. For Walter, added Florence, bursting into tears. He liked you very much and said before he died that he was fond of you and said, remember Walter, and if you'll be a brother to me, Walter, now that he is gone and I have none on earth, I'll be your sister all my life and think of you like one wherever we may be. This is what I wished to say, my dear, to say, dear Walter, but I cannot say it as I would because my heart is full. And in its fullness and its sweet simplicity, she held out both her hands to me. Walter, taking them, stooped down and touched the tearful face that didn't, that neither shrunk nor turned away nor reddened as he did so, but looked at up, up at him with confidence and truth. In that one moment, every shadow of doubt or agitation passed away from Walter's soul. It seemed to him that he responded to her innocent appeal beside the dead child's bed and in the solemn presence he had seen there, pledged himself to cherish and protect her very image in his banishment, which brotherly, with brotherly regard to garner up her simple faith inviolate and hold himself degraded if he breathed upon it any thought that was not in, his, in her own breast when she gave it to him. Susan Nipper, who had bitten both her bonnet strings at once and imparted a great deal of private emotion to the skylight, during this transaction, now changed the subject by inquiring who took milk and who took sugar, and being enlightened on these points, poured out the tea. They all four gathered socially about the little table and took tea under that young lady's active superintendence when the presence of Florence in the back parlor brightened the tartar frigid on the wall. Half an hour ago, Ago, Walter's life would have hardly called her by his, her name, but he could do so now when she entreated him. He could think of her being there without a lurking misgiving that it would have been better if she had not come. He could calmly think how beautiful she was, how full of promise, what a hum some happy man find in such a heart some day, one day. He could reflect upon his own place in that heart with pride and with a brave determination. If not to deserve it, he still thought that far above him, never to deserve it less. Some fairy influence most sure, must surely have hovered around the hands of Susan Nipper when she made the tea, engendering the tranquil air that reigned in the back parlor during its discussion. Some counter-influence must surely have hovered around the hands of Uncle Saul's chronometer and moved them faster than the tartar frigid ever went before the wind. Be this as it may, the visitors, visitors had a coach in waiting at a quiet corner not far off, and the chronometer on being incidentally referred to gave such a positive opinion that it had been waiting a long time that it was impossible to doubt the fact, especially when stated on such an unimpeachable authority. If Uncle Saul had been going to be hanged by his own time, he never would have allowed that the chronometer was too fast by the least fraction of a second. Florence, at parting, rec recapitulated to the old man all that she had said before and bound him to their compact. Uncle Saul attended her lovingly to the legs of the wooden midshipman and there resigned her to Walter, who was ready to escort her and Susan Nipper to the coach. Walter, said Florence, by the way, I have been afraid to ask before your uncle. Do you think you'll be absent very long? Indeed, said Walter. I don't know. I fear so. Mr. Dombey signified as much, I thought, when he appointed me. Is it favor, Walter, inquired Florence, after a moment's hesitation and looking anxiously at, in his face. The appointment returned Walter, yes. Walter would have given anything to have answered in the affirmative but his face answered before him, before his lips could, and Florence was too attentive to it not to understand its reply. I am afraid you have scarcely been in favor with Papa, she said timidly. There is no reason, replied Walter, smiling, why I should be. There was no reason, said Walter. No reason, Walter? There was no reason, said Walter, understanding what she meant. 
There are many people employed in the house between Mr. Dombey and a young man like me. <clears throat> There's a wide space of separation. If I do my duty, I do what I ought and do no more than all the rest. <clears throat> had Florence any misgiving, of which she was hardly conscious, any misgiving that had, hard, that had sprung into an indistinct and undefined existence since that recent night when she had gone down to her father's room, that Walter's accidental interest in her and early knowledge of her might have involved him in that powerful displeasure and dislike. Had Walter any such idea or any n sudden thought that it was in her mind at the mo that moment, neither of them hinted at it, neither of them spoke at all. For some short time, Susan, walking on the other side of Walter, eyed them both sharply and certainly. Miss Nipper's thoughts traveled in that direction, and very confidently, too. You may come back very soon, said Florence, perhaps, Walter. I may come back, said Walter, an old man and find you an old lady, but I hope for better things. Papa, said Florence, after a moment, will, will recover from his grief and speak more freely to me one day. Perhaps, and if he should, I will tell him how much I wish to see you back again, and ask him to recall you for my sake. There was a touching modulation in these words about her father that Walter understood too well. The coach being close at hand, she, he would have left her without speaking, for now he felt what parting was had Florence held his hand when she was seated, and then he found there was a little packet in her own. Walter, she said, looking full upon him with her affection, affectionate eyes like you, I hope for better things. I'll pray for them and believe that they will arrive. Made this little gift for Paul. Pray take it with you, with my love, and do not look at it until they, until you are gone away. And now, God bless you, Walter. Never forget me. You are my brother, dear. He was glad that Susan Nipper came between them, or he might have left her with a sorrowful remembrance of him. He was glad, too, that she did not look out of the coach again, but waved the little hand to him instead as long as he could see it. In spite of her request, he could not help opening the packet that night when he went to bed. It was a little purse, and there was money in it, bright rose the sun next morning from his absence in strange countries, and up rose... Walter with it to receive the captain, who was already at the door, having turned out earlier than was necessary in order to get under way while Mrs. McStinger was yet st slumbering. The captain, pretending, pretended to be in tiptoe top spirits and brought a very smoky tongue in one of the pockets of the broad blue coat for breakfast. And Walter, said the captain, when they took their seats at table, if your uncle's the man I think him, He'll bring out the last bottle of the Madeira on the present occasion. No, no, Ned, returned the old man. No, that shall be open when Walter comes home again. Well said, cried the captain. Hear him. There it lies, said, old, said Saul Gills, down in the little cellar, covered with dirt and cobwebs. There may be dirt and cobwebs over you and me, perhaps, Ned, before it sees the light. Hear him, cried the captain. Good morality, Walter, my lad. Train of a fig tree in the way it should go, and when you are old, sit under the shade on it. Overhaul. The, re the well, said the captain, one on second thoughts. I ain't quite certain where that's to be found. But when found, make a note of all of Saul Gill's heave head again. But there, or somewhere, it shall lie. Ned, until Wally comes back to claim it, said the old man. That's all I meant to say. And well said, too, returned the captain. And if we three don't crack that bottle in company, I'll give you to leave my... You two leave to drink my allowance, notwithstanding the captain's excessive joviality. He made but a poor hand at the smoky tongue, though he tried very hard when anybody looked at him to appear as if he were eating with a vast appetite. He was terribly afraid, likewise of being left alone with either uncle or nephew, appearing to consider that his only chance of safety as to keeping up appearances was in the being always three together. This terror on the part of the captain reduced him to such ingenuous evasions as running to the door when Solomon went to put his coat on under pretense of having seen an extraordinary hackney coach pass, and darting out into the road when Walter went upstairs to take leave of the lodgers on a feint of smelling fire in a neighboring chimney. These artifices Captain Cuddle deemed inscrutable by any uninspired observer. 
Walter was coming down from his parting expedition with a great effort that made his face very red, pulled up the silver watch, which was so big and so tight in his pocket that it came out like a bung. That's what I said, a bung. I don't know what that is. Anyway, Walter said the captain, handing it over and shaking him heartily by the hand. A parting gift, my lad. Put it back half an hour every morning and that, and about another quarter towards the afternoon, and it's a watch that'll do you credit. Captain Cuddle, I couldn't think of it, cried Walter, detaining him, for he was running away. Pray take it back. I have one already. Then Walter, said the captain, suddenly diving into one of his pockets and bringing up the two teaspoons and the sugar tongs with which he had armed himself to meet such an objection. Take this here trifle of a plate instead. No, no, I couldn't indeed, cried Walter. A thousand thanks. Don't throw them away, Captain Cuddle, for the captain was about to jerk them overboard. They'll be of much more use to you than me. Give me your stick. I have often thought that I should like to have it. There, goodbye, Captain Cuddle. Take care of my uncle, Uncle Saul. God bless you. They were over the side in the confusion before Walter caught another glimpse of either, and when he ran up to the stern and looked after them, he saw his uncle hanging down his head in the boat, and Captain Cuddle wrapping him on the back with the great silver watch. He must have been very painful, and gesticulating hopefully with the teaspoons and, sil and sugar tongs, catching sight of Walter, Captain Cuddle dropped the property into the bottom of the boat with perfect unconcern being evidently oblivious of, exist of its existence and pulling off the glazed hat, he held a mustly. The glazed hat made quite a show in the sun. With its glistening, and the captain continued to wave it until he could be seen no longer. Then the confusion on board, which had been rapidly increasing, reached its height. Two or three other boats went away with a cheer. The sails shone bright and full above as Walter watched them spread their surface to, their fa to the favorable breeze, the water flew in sparkles from the prow, and off upon her voyage went the sun and air as hopefully and trippingly as many another sun and air gone down had started on his way before her. Day after day, old Saul and Captain Cuddle kept her <coughs> reckoning in the little back parlor and worked out a course with the chart spread before them on the round table at night. When old Saul climbed upstairs so lonely to the attic where it sometimes blew great guns, he looked up at the stars and listened to the wind and kept a longer watch than would have fallen to his lot on aboard the ship. The last bottle of the old Madeira which he had which had, had its cruising days and known its dangers of the deep lay silently beneath its dust and cobwebs in the meanwhile undisturbed. And that's the end of chapter 19, and then we're going to get on to the summary next. And we are at the summary and analysis of Dickens' Dombey and Son. There's one second here. Chapter 13, summary. At his fir firm, two managers, Mr. Morphin and Mr. Carker, said Mr. aid Mr. Dombey. Morphin is amiable, while Carker is very crafty. Mr. Carker mentions that the firm needs to send someone to work at, his, at its office in the Barbados and is going to let Morphin choose whom to send. Dombey, however, happens to be interrupted by Walter, who come back again. Um, Dombey, however, happens to be interrupted by Walter, who uncomfortably reminds him of Florence. He announces to Walter that he will be sending him to the West Indies. Walter is stunned, but agrees to go. After the conversation, James Carker, manager, summons John Carker Jr. into his office. James is, is angry at being reminded of John's presence and alludes to a disgrace he has caused. Walter is distressed by this exchange and tries to take the blame. After he leaves, he hears the brothers continuing to talk and John Carker explaining that Walter reminds him of the person he once was. He says that he has looked out for him, hoping Walter could, would not make the same mistakes he had. Walter questions John Carker about this afterwards, and John explains that he had stolen money from the firm as a young man and was disgraced but was allowed to continue work, working in a low-ranking position. He is deeply ashamed and no longer has any hopes or ambitions in life. Chapter 14 Despite his academic difficulties and dreamy ways, Paul has gradually bonded with the staff and students at the Blimber School. At the same time, he has become sicklier. He is released from his studies shortly before the vacation is to begin. 
as the school prepares for an end-of-term party, a future pu pupil and his parents, the Skettles, arrive to visit the school. Paul and Florence charm everyone, and when Paul leaves the school to return to London for the vacation, he has shown a great deal of affection. He returns to London where a state of confusion and the reaction of other characters suggests that his health is declining. Walter, chapter 15. Walter has been delaying telling his uncle that he will be moving to the West Indies. He explains to Captain Cuddle that he is worried about what the news will mean for his uncle. And he asks for help convincing him that his absence will only be temporary. He also wants Saul to think that his position excuse me, in the West Indies is a good one, when it really is, and it is really a very humble one. Walter asks Captain Cuddle to break the news to his uncle, and while he does so, Walter goes for a long walk. Wandering along, he's accosted by Susan Nipper, who is trying to find her way to Stagg's garden. Paul, very ill, and wants to see Richards, and Nipper is trying to find her. It turns out that Stagg's garden has been destroyed due to the construction of railway tracks, but that they are able to learn the new address of the Toodles and go there. Walter personally escorts Susan and Richards back to the Dombey house. Chapter 16, summary, short summary. Paul says his farewells to Walter and Richards and then dies in the arms of his sister. Chapter 17, summary. Captain Cuddle has delayed telling Saul the news about Walter's new job because he had hoped he could persuade Mr. Dombey to change his mind. However, Paul's death makes that possibility unlikely, so he tells Solomon, make, making it sound like a good opportunity for Walter. Saul is shocked, but reconciles himself to the idea. Captain Cuddle continues to feel uneasy, so he decides to go and speak to Carker. Carker seems to reassure him that Walter has bright prospects in the firm, and Cuddle is too trusting and optimistic to be suspicious. He expresses his hopes of there someday being a marriage between Florence and Walter. Chapter 18, Summary Mr. Dombey is paralyzed by grief. Miss, Mrs. Chick tells Florence that Sir Bonnet and Lady Skettles have invited her to stay with them. Florence says she would rather stay at home, even though she learns that her father is planning to go abroad. Mr. Toots also comes to visit her and brings her Diogenes, the dog that Paul had befriended at the Blimper School. Florence makes one overture to try to share her grief with her father and form a closer relationship with her father, but he behaves coldly towards her. I'm sure to his ruination. Chapter 19, uh, Summary. Before Walter leaves, he speaks with Susan Nipper and asks her to keep his uncle informed about Florence's well-being. Just as Walter is about to leave, though, Florence and Susan Nipper unexpectedly appear at the shop. Florence wishes Walter well and asks if she can occasionally visit Saul to keep him company. She also pledges to think of Walter like a brother. She is able to discern, however, that the new job is not a favorable opportunity and expresses her hope that she will someday be able to persuade her father to summon him home. The next morning, John Carker also comes to bid Walter goodbye. Walter sails off to the West Indies, leaving his uncle and Captain Cuddle to hopefully wait, wait his return. And we're at the analysis of 13 through 19. In this section, major sources of conflict and trauma in, are introduced into the novel. While up until this point, it may have seemed that Dombey would be the villain of the novel, the introduction of Carper, Carker establishes a truly dangerous figure. While Dombey can be proud and cruel, his motives and behaviors are always readily apparent. Carker, on the other hand, clearly plots, schemes, and conceals his true intentions. The tone towards him is sinister from the very beginning. The reveal of Carker's family history and his relationship with his brother John furthers the way in which the novel is critical of family relationships. Carker is capable of completely cutting off his brother and sister if they seem likely to interfere with his plan of advancement. His own pride runs deeper than family sentiment. Similarly, Dombey's resentment and discomfort around the daughter, who acts as an uncomfortable reminder of his failure as a father. It's so strong that it prompts him to lash out against Walter by assigning him to the post in the West Indies. In the Victorian era, with travel limited to sea vessels and communication limited to handwritten letters, that could have taken months or years. 
to arrive. This assignment ensured Walter would have virtually no contact with his friends or family. Both the sea voyage and life in the Caribbean, where tropical disease was a common killer, are dangerous. See, humans have been mean since day one. Dombey effectively throws away the life of someone's child because of his own pride and stubbornness. Walter's departure is shown to be deeply traumatic for the individuals who have come to care about him, such as Saul, Cuddle, and Florence. He demonstrates his advancing maturity and a more pragmatic view of the world. In the deception he orchestrates, both he and Florence can sense that Dom Dombey was now acting out of benevolent sentiment in giving him this position. She, this shows the clarity and intelligence of the youthful figures. Saul and especially Cuddle seem paradoxically more naive in their willingness to hope that this voyage will turn out to be a good opportunity for Walter. Misplaced trust is a theme throughout the novel. Florence tolerates what is effectively emotional abuse from her father because she cannot accept that he is a cruel man at heart. Cuddle because his innate tendency is to see goodness in people. Is too willing to trust Carker and Dombey, a, weaker, a weakness that Carker does not hesitate to exploit. Walter's departure, with all the uncertainty surrounding whether and when he will see his friends again, mirrors another tragic loss in this section. Paul's death, while heavily foreshadowed, represents a central trauma that will animate much of the rest of the action. It suggests the fragility of life and the insignificance of much of what other characters value. The death, however, is anticlimactic. It seems that it could serve as an epiphany for Dombey, but... In fact, it just deepens his negative character traits. Rather than leading him to value his own only surviving child more, it deepens the gulf between him and Florence. It also makes him more possessive and jealous of Paul's memory. Rather than realizing that others are also grieving for the child and taking solace in this, becomes even more bitter and, and resentful. And now, I mean, I know this is a different era, but you can also see subtle similarities in in that people exploiting other people's what they consider weaknesses like someone seeing the goodness in everybody like captain cuddles and then dombey mr dombey and then who was it the um carker is exploiting that <clears throat> that's what people do nowadays they take advantage of what they see as weaknesses so and, and other people so it, i mean there are and I guess you could, could uh, to this current administration, there are a lot of people who are, who, who have blinders on their eyes because they're looking for the good in the government. But uh, the really, what's happening is really no good. And you really can't have, it's not that you don't want to have faith in everything. You'd like to see the good, but you also can't let everything go to ruin because you have to step up sometimes. But that said, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. And also stay tuned for the next installment, Chapter 20 in Charles Dickens' Dobby and Son.